This episode is brought to you by Hub24, whose purpose is to connect advisors to innovative solutions that create opportunity. They're massive supporters of advisors, in particular those going solo, uh, and they're one of the early players in the managed account space, and, and their epic functionality in that area, as well as their commitment to user experience, has led them to become a market leader in terms of advisor satisfaction. I can speak from personal experience when I say their BDM team are total legends, and they're there to help you work through the best solutions for your business. So you can check out more information at hub24.com.au. This episode is also brought to you by Centuria, who are a boutique ultra high performing fund manager. They've won pretty much all the awards there are to win. Uh, They've got a bunch of five star rated funds and they're heavy into technical support for advisors around their products and strategies. On top of that, they're just an awesome group of people and they've got a dedicated team there to support you. And if you haven't already spoken to the guys at Centuria and heard about what they do, do yourself a favor and reach out. G'day, Caitlin. G'day. How's it going? Very good. <laughs> very good, very good. Hey, um, so we met a, a couple of weeks ago uh, about uh, venture capital and things like that. Yes. Um, but you just happen to have one of the coolest stories that I've come across in my professional life, um, <laughs> <laughs> truly. And then looking more into it. This um, is to everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was feeling special until that moment. Thank you. But it is pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And then especially... Uh, it's like devil and angel, I think. This is going to be the dark side and the light it side. It both ways. Funnily <laughs> enough, uh, only a couple of podcasts ago, it turned into Muhammad and Fraser. Okay. Uh, yeah, Muhammad Ali, Ali and, and, and um, Fraser. Joe Fraser. Right. Joe Fraser, okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, it's not the first time that's happened. <laughs> um, but, uh, but with this whole thing with financial advice, it's becoming a lot more uh, female orientated and we're starting to see some really awesome female... Uh, founders Mm -hmm. of of financial planning businesses uh, coming out, making a real splash to the point where our last event, uh, which I know I showed you, was a a panel entirely of uh, female founders. Mm -hmm. And they- Yeah, and and, but they (laughs) were definitely there on their own merit. It wasn't a female event. It was, how can we learn? And, And that is one of the things that I've noticed from financial planning is this uh, female theme. Mm -hmm. And you have recently uh, started Capital XX. And so I thought you would definitely have some awesome insight into um, into, uh, why we're starting to see uh, this theme and it's growing rapidly, I would Mm. say. And from our conversations, you were saying there's better outcomes with female founders, uh, both with success of the outcome, also with the uh, profit Mm. as well. So I thought you were definitely the best person to to come on and uh, lead us through why you think uh, female founders are doing so well in business in general, uh, and then we can obviously scope it down into financial advice later. Yeah. Cool. So maybe I'll start with a bit of an overview of the business case um, to the value that female founders represent in the, the VC startup ecosystem. Yep. Um, and then we can sort of go through maybe some of those trends that flow, flow from startup through to what you guys um, are seeing. Definitely. So, you know, what I've really tried to do with my experience um, in setting up a um, or being part of a team that set up a, a venture fund that's gender neutral, it became really apparent that there was was this missed opportunity for everyone and for an Mm. investor. And as a VC, at the end of the day, my real responsibility is to maximise return to investors. Mm -hmm. And what became very apparent is that female founders globally um, deliver far higher return on investment, revenue and company valuation. And the stats actually say 12% higher revenue, 35% um, higher return on investment and 64% higher company valuation pre-exit and 46% Post. That's cr- wow. isn't that just crazy? So let's remove gender. That's a great business decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, and it gets even better from the perspective that, from an investor's perspective, not from an overall ecosystem perspective, yeah. female founders have secured less than seven percent of global VC dollars over the last te- uh, ten years, and last year it was two percent. What is it going down? It's going down. Down. What? So there's actually a blue ocean opportunity. I know everyone does yeah. this face, like, hang on, I don't get it. And what I'm really trying to educate the market on is let's take off this label, label sorry, of female versus male, us mm. versus them. Totally. 
you know, there is a $20 trillion cost currently to our economy from the lack of female participation in senior positions of business and leadership. And that's that's sort of extrapolating the statistical yeah. benefits you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what we've got is this hockey stick where the cost is increasing dramatically because female roles in the traditional economy are becoming redundant at a far faster rate. And really? I'll explain that. Ooh. Women tend to, historically, work in more admin, marketing, HR types of roles. Right. These are the roles that are becoming most impacted by automation and AI. Right. So if you look at, first, the opportunity to translate those skills from mm. one side into, into the new economy, they're not there. Mm. And um, we know that this is not a, a competence issue. I mean, I'm just giving you the stats. It's exactly. not competence, it's confidence. And we really need to get more women to see the opportunity of tech and start to translate their skills from traditional over into the new economy, which is not happening. And we've got very low participation rates at the moment of about 20% of female participation in the new economy. So would you say it's more barrier to entry or more lack of interest? Um, it's not lack of interest. No. Um, it's... I think there's awareness. Mm -hmm. It's not interest per se. So I think if you don't have a network of individuals that have got exposure to starting a startup, mm. you're probably going to be less inclined, whether, you're a, whether yep. you're a guy, whether you're a girl. Yep. If you don't have that network, then you don't have the role models, you don't have the people to follow. Mm -hmm. And it's important for women to be able to say, say, you know, I've seen my friend Sally or Jane or mm. any other name, <laughs> yeah. start a startup. And I, I therefore know what it's going to be like. I know what the challenges are. I've got someone to talk to when it does get hard. Mm. Because if you don't, you know, you hit that first roadblock and just think, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing and I'm out of here. Well, that's so, actually like one of the key essences of XY Advisor to an extent because there's so many small business owners. Mm. And they, this is XY Advisor is one of the ways they get that feeling of other people yeah. being on the same journey. Of, of, of learning by osmosis, mm. I yeah. guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that, you know, that very much replicates itself in the startup ecosystem. Yeah, so that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to bring more females together, getting exposed to each other. And then just let the magic happen. Well, I think from my side, I've tried to use my voice and experience in setting up a fund as part of a team, not directly, mm -hmm. um, to just bring awareness and bring awareness as much to the startup ecosystem, but really to investors. Um, and that to date has tended to be more men. Um, and, you know, we're trying to encourage more women to look at investing in VC and everyone to invest in VC as an asset class, yeah. but to encourage the current body of investors to actually look outside mm. where they're currently placing their dollars and look at it and say, hang on, like that face you made before was a huge opportunity. <laughs> Why am I not actually engaging with this market more and more often? So, you, so you're saying there's a bit of, I guess, helping guide and develop, foster that um, familiarity with yeah. uh, developing businesses and that sort of like what's happened over years, like with, um, I guess, the male side of that, that area. Mm. Um, and then it's also actually going, having people there to accept and actually be interested and not just shut it down prematurely. Yeah. I think that there's two sides. There's one, an education component which is very important to the ecosystem regardless. Mm -hmm. You know, Australia is very much at the start of its um, mm. lifespan, I suppose, in the VC and also startup space. Mm. We've proven to be amazing innovators. Now we've got to learn really how to um, produce results and commercialise. And then from my side, it's, okay, let's make our startup community aware of the talent and opportunity and the investors. And then the next bit is really to, to um, bring a pool of capital um, to life that can be made available to, to female founders. So that's probably the, the second bit, and that's the capital X component. And then How you do have we... the ETF off the back of that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, with those stats, I want to be in that ETF. Right? <laughs> well, uh, we're working on it. Um, Please okay. hold. <laughs> um, actually, while we have you here, and, and you did allude to this before, it was giving females uh, awareness that, that they have a friend that's done this. Mm. While we have you here, can mm. you, and, and no one likes to talk about themselves and I, and I get that, but I would love for you to share a bit of your story. So if there's any female, uh, entre well, I should say uh, financial planners who, who are considering to becoming entrepreneurs and starting their business, 
you're a great example of oh, this, you. right? And so, uh, you know, uh, I even just love the story about your dad's piece of advice and then fast forward 18 years and there you are on Necker Island. And, <laughs> and, and that's so cool. And it would be awesome if you could share with us your story. Oh, okay, cool. Um, happy to. Um, well, I suppose my story really for me starts... Um, funnily enough, at the start of year 12 or during my school years. So I'm dyslexic, can't read or write properly still. Um, And I tell that because I think regardless of gender or where you come from, there's kind of these connotations that starting up a startup is quite easy and all of a sudden you become an overnight success and then you're selling your, you know, your business for a billion dollars. That's what it's like, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And while we'd all like that to be the case, that's not necessarily true. So I sort of tell a bit about dyslexia because it really, um, at that time, not being able to read or write properly, really takes you out of the game. I mean, if you can't communicate, how are you going to do anything? <laughs> yeah. Um, And I think the one thing that's important for business owners and entrepreneurs regardless is just sheer persistence. You know, the ability to sit when it's really uncomfortable and just keep on going. Um, So would you still sit, I guess, if someone's doing a presentation, mm. you're... How's that experience like? Yeah, so for me, it's, it, and that's the, the most common question, like mm. how can you be in this industry and like what's going <laughs> on there? So for me, it's not numbers that play with me. Um, it's the written word. Okay. So it's even more important for me when I get a pitch deck that it's like 10 to 12 slides, problem, solution, really clearly articulated. With loud sound. <laughs> well, <laughs> with, really, <laughs> with really just simple communication about all those key aspects that any investor is going to want to see. So I suppose I'm, I'm a good guinea pig because if I get it, anybody mm. else is going to get it. Um, That's what Clay says about me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and you just you learn workarounds. Everyone's got a weakness, right? Mm. And I think that the reason why I try and tell my story of my greatness, greatest weakness is it's actually ended up being my greatest success or, or key to success because it's what actually really makes me, um, I think, valuable in this ecosystem because my brain, when you present me with a problem in any dyslexic's brain, every area fires up mm. when you're presented with a problem, whereas a non-dyslexic's brain, when you do ECGs, follows a very strategic path. You know, it goes from point A to point B to point C and it's quite methodical. I wouldn't mind t- Where's this test? I wouldn't mind. Well, there's heaps of stuff online and yeah. there's, you know, for anyone that's listening, there's lots of just type in what is it like to be dyslexic and there'll be examples that come up. Anyway, this is not me in a therapy show. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, really interesting. So, no, so let's get back to, <laughs> to journey. But when I told my dad that I couldn't read or write at the start of year 12 after going through, you know, pretty much all my school education, he said to me three key things. Um, if you want to do this, you're going to have to work harder than anybody else. But if Richard Branson can do it, so can you. And, you know, that that sort of became a, a mantra for me. And I never thought that I'd get the opportunity to meet Richard. Yeah. And it was not because of celebrity that I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm meeting yeah. Mr. Virgin, like the, the Richard <laughs> Branson. But to have someone, and this comes back to role modelling, it's so important to have someone in business and in life that you can look up to yeah. and um, keep trying to emulate their behaviour and their winning strategies because fundamentally it'll lead you to them. And, and you know, how I got to Necker Island, I'm still like I'm not really sure how it all came mm-hmm. to bear. But, um, you know, serendipity and everything Would aligned and lots of hard work. Was a desire? Like just actually wanting to? Oh, 100%. Yeah. It was on my bucket list, but mm. I had no idea how it was going to happen. Like, absolutely no idea. Like, how do you get to Richard Branson? <laughs> yeah. But even to, to let it be on the bucket list, I think that's what, like, a lot of people, they don't even let stuff like that get onto their list. Yeah. So if you don't put it on your list, it's definitely not happening. 100%. So, and, like, that, I think that's sort of a bit of a reflection on the mindset that you had to adopt. Yeah. 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 Well, it was just so important to me. Like, I really wanted to meet him and say thank you. Like, thank you for being that person that shared your story and thank you for being that person that, you know, when it got tough for me, at least I could say, well, hang on, someone else has done this. That's awesome. Because mm. if I hadn't had that, I honestly don't know that I would have kept pushing. So mm. I really encourage anyone to find whoever that person is for you and read about everything they're doing, learn what they learn, see what they watch on YouTube, watch what they're watching on Twitter because 
you know, then your brain starts to pick up their habits and that sort of helps you Well, and that step would feed up. into the, the vent, like what you're doing 100%. with the female. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thing. And that's why I try and tell my story. It's why I try and be as available, I suppose, to either share my experience of being an entrepreneur, which I have been. I've set up businesses in the Middle East. And well, to that end, yeah, explain how that all came about. Because <laughs> I was reading it and, and basically I can tell there's a, a bit of a shortened part of the story because it goes, <laughs> I was doing one thing. Now I'm in Dubai or Abu Dhabi, was it? Dubai. 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 Uh, with an investment property business. And I was like, oh, how did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. So I think to be an entrepreneur, you're going to be a little bit crazy. Totally. And I think that's a great thing, yeah. right? Um, I'm very happy not to just be one-dimensional. I'm very happy to be <laughs> multi-dimensional. And I had really wanted to work and travel overseas. Um, my niece, who's very close to me in age, um, became very sick um, with cancer. And I remember sitting beside a hospital bed and thinking, you know, if I was in that position and at that stage we didn't think she would recover, but thankfully she has. She's alive and well and just got married, so that's all good. She's Fantastic. very happy. Um I remember thinking, well, you know, if I was in that position and this is D-Day, what would I have wished that I'd done with my life that I otherwise am not going to do sort of thing? And I came home um, to my partner at the time um, and said, I'm moving to Dubai to set up a property investment company. And I think from memory his words are, you have lost the plot. (laughs) And I just remember this look of... (laughs) complete and utter dread on his face. Uh, like, how old were you at the time? This was 2000 and oh, the, the end of 2003. So we would have been, you know, young to middle 20s. We'd wow. been together for a long time. I was the crazy entrepreneur. He had been at the same company for a very long period of time in the wine industry and had just started working in the family property business. So he was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Could you could you give an insight to people around that Why? process, <laughs> like how you got there? <laughs> There's no process. It was just such a like I look at it now and go that it was crazy. It was crazy, and he was right when he looked at me and said, "You've lost it." I'm sure I had semi lost it. Right? You've got someone you love, love so it. much. It's D Day. You don't think they're going to survive? I'd wanted to work and travel overseas. It's like, oh my gosh, none of us know how long we have left. And I basically came home and said, that's what I'm going to do. So I, I left and he followed and he's still there, which is difficult. Right. Because he doesn't like the heat. He liked cycling and at that stage there was no cycling inside of the UAE and he's now started up a cycling Indoor pub. cycling? Or? No, outdoor. Ooh. And he loved coffee. Um, and that was probably the one consistent thing that he was going to get them both. But I went over and set up a property investment company and with a group and started selling Australian property to expats. That's amazing. So it's it's just one of those moments when I suppose when you the the outtake is when you, your gut says go, don't get too into your head and start to rationalise, which gets harder as you get older and you've mm. got responsibilities. I think it was just the gravitas of that personal situation that pushed me to say this is it. Yeah. Um. But, you know, this year I'm, I'm starting to spend 50% of my time in China, so it's kind of like oh ground my God. <laughs> Whereabouts in China? Well, wait, <laughs> before, before we get to that, so so you, you because there's there's a bit to cover still. Uh, so how long, so you mid-20s, do you get to 30 or just before 30? No, so um, 24, 2004, so now everyone knows my age. Um, <laughs> that whole lie about me sort of discounting my age has now been broken. Um, so I can't count, so. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so 24, I go over to Dubai. Mm-hmm. Um, I went over a couple of months yep. before he came over. And um, we just, we had an Australian business partner before we left. That had been sort of a serendipitous moment that I suppose had made all of it possible. Yep. Because if you've got a business over there, you have to have someone that has a relationship back to a um, UAE national. Right. So Is that it like a percentage share in what you're doing. Yeah, they've they've got to have you've got to have a trailing line back to one of the national one families. Of the royal families. Seriously. Yeah. Well, a national, not necessarily okay. part of the Sheikh's family, but you have to have there has to be a, a share of profit that that moves into a, like a national. Area. Yeah, exactly. And there's no tax, so you know that sort of that makes sense. Out. Yeah. Right. Um, 
so that just kind of happened. And I think my experience in life is when you're really clear about what you want, whether it's Richard Branson, whether it's about I'm moving to Dubai and I don't know how to do it. I'm moving to Shanghai, don't know how to do it. Whoa. The second you're really clear about what you do and don't want, there's something about the brain that starts looking for what does work. And if you're really clear when you're talking to people, they start to say, hey, I know someone in Shanghai or you should speak to this person in whatever country. So I think the little gem that comes out of all of that is be really like crystal clear about what you're trying to achieve in your business and who who are the people that are going to be helpful to move the dial for you and, and deliver measurable results, which is so very important to anyone that's a suppose the challenge with some people, I talk from my experience, I've often found it difficult and historically to zero in on things. And uh, Yeah. That's an understatement. <laughs> uh, so, so it's, but when you do, it's really powerful. Yeah, it and, really is. And then, so you come back and with a team set up Artesian. No, so, no, 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 I, c- I can't take any credit for, for setting up Artesian at all. It was a business that had been in existence way before me. Right. Um, and the business had been in existence since 2003. Right. And um, they didn't traditionally launch inside of the, the VC space, but as a result of the um, global financial crisis, which brought me back to Australia, um, I think that was a catalyst for them to start to look at, okay, well, let's get into VC. Mm. Mm. And so and you came in as MD? Um, I was one of the team there, yes. And, um, you know, um, there's a there's a big, decent team now all mm. helping to, to raise money and, and build out, um, I suppose, a, a different model for venture capital. Traditional VC hadn't delivered a return for 10 years, you know, yeah. negative 5.5%. So. Wow trying to pick the winners in Australia at that time. And I don't think we've really seen any um, anyone that has consistently been able to say, yes, you're a winner, yes, you're a winner, mm. no, you're not necessarily. Um, you know, there's so many exogenous factors that make startups successful or not, and that's not always just the people mechanics. It's what's going on in the environment at a global level, at a mm. domestic level. So, um, you know, I, I followed in line with their philosophy and it's the same philosophy now that we're carrying over into into the new fund, which is let's partner with um, individuals in the ecosystem that get access to high-quality, high-volume deal flow mm. so that when they present to one of our partners, they get rid of 90% of the businesses that are not yet ready for investment. Mm. They might be ready next year. It's not to say that the idea is wrong or the team's wrong. It's just not ready for investment yet. Um, with, with, with like the, I guess for those out there that don't quite get what happens in this space, like mm. it's, a, it's, it's cool. It sounds awesome, venture capital. But um, I, I guess some people may not quite get the flow of how this whole situation works. Yeah. And so like in layman's term, how would you explain venture capital and what well, goes on? Yeah, so venture capital is, you know, the, the investment of a pool of money, generally not just the, the venture capitalists. So a venture um, group will raise a fund, usually, um, that has capital from a whole range of different individuals. And in Australia, that's... and globally to this point really has been wholesale investors. So high net worths, family offices, institutions like super funds, corporates, um, those that understand, I suppose, a little bit more the financial system and, and, and in them potentially losing the money that they invest, they're not as at as great a risk as a mum or dad. So there's some some movement about retail money starting to move into the space through equity-based crowdfunding, but at the moment it's been an investment area sort of limited to that specific group that just, I talked about. they just hand the money over and... You'd love to think that that was the case. Like you just rock up to the ATM and say... <laughs> Check out these guys, they're going to be amazing. <laughs> Please, sir, can I have some more? Um, but really they're there to make sure that if I'm an investor and you're the VC, I give you $10 more than that, but let's just use that in this example, and that you ring me in a period of time and say, I've got 10 times the money that you gave me and I'm very, very happy. Mm. Um, but that model of then trying to pick that business to put the money into to get the 10 times return hasn't necessarily worked. Mm. Um, it's like, like sharpshooting them. I know, I know there's a more pooled concept now where you can sort of you get exposure to more, so you're diversifying. So we go for the more, yeah. right? So versus the let's try and pick 
20 winners, we say let's pick a big portfolio of, of startups. So in the case of Capital X, it'll be up to 500 female founders. Oh, wow. And why I say up to is it could be two female founders together. It could be me and you as long as I own equal, if not more equity, yeah, right? Okay. So a founding team may not always be one person. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll go through our partners like I was describing before. We'll buy a little bit of our business or my business, whichever example we're following. And then if we're successful and show market traction and we go to a subsequent raise, so we're going to raise $500,000, as long as we can get 50% of the next raise um, filled by three individual unrelated investors, Okay we will then top up the other bit. And I'll explain why so it's, like it's underwriting. Well, it's market um, it's market proof. Mm. Because if you can get three individual investors, let's say we're the investors and we mm. don't know each other, we're all going to have done our due diligence before we hand over our hard earned money. Totally. So that's three sets of individuals going, oh, does this work? Is mm. the market working? Is it not? Do I believe that this business has traction? Can the founders deliver on their promise? Mm-hmm. For us, we then look at these three investors and say, okay, these three people that just met over the pub after one too many drinks, that's (laughs) not good due diligence, so we're not going to follow there. Right. But if we're three sophisticated business persons and we've gone out and we've done our DD and it sounds solid and and we think we're representing our investors well then yes we'll 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 top up and on and on we go so you end up with that <clears throat> that's like twi- a quadruple blind yeah test right it's always de-risking so yeah. we get the de-risk at the start through partners mm-hmm. and then we get a de-risk at every subsequent raise mm-hmm. because there's got to be 50 percent closed before we will go cool. in that makes that's smart so and it's we- darwin in theory yeah Survival of the fittest. Totally. Okay. And have you, you would have identified individuals that maybe uh, make better decisions than other individuals? Well, our DD is making sure that we find the right partners who have enough deal flow, have enough quality deal flow, and that their due diligence process is one that we feel um, de-risks the opportunity and maximises a return for our investors. Mm-hmm. So that's where we de- do Sorry, our DD. Right. Um with with those individuals and in the case of capital x you know it'll be in australia and it'll be into asia and also into the us so our investors get exposure across those three key markets and that's another de-risking strategy so awesome sounds so exciting so what so you're shipping off did you say shanghai Shanghai will be um, a base uh, for this year and into next year. Uh-huh. So I'll be here 50% of my time and I'll be over there 50% of my time. Wow. And and that's just because oh, in China, what's attracting you there? Is it is it uh, investor money or is it entrepreneurs or both? Well, there's a couple of things. I think there's, um, firstly, there's investors that we haven't yet um, developed relationships with um, and allowed their capital to, to flow into um, a fund like this. Mm-hmm. We're seeing some amazing female founders come and 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 male founders, so gender neutral across the board, we're seeing phenomenal um, Asian talent. Mm. Um, I think we overinflate the value of America inside of this whole journey. We've got a great neighbour that's got great tech uh, and money to invest into the sector. Um, and so it's an area that hasn't been as um, uh, um, know, what's attractive, word? as attractive, accessible, and tapped. Right. Yes. So there's opportunity, um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for great Australian talent to to leapfrog over the well, let's call it the ditch over into into China as well as the US. Could- yeah, because you're right. As soon as an entrepreneur makes it in China, they make it. Yeah. They, they, you don't have to go anywhere else. I mean, mm-hmm. as far as I am aware, the, the Chinese version of Uber is bigger than Uber. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. And I think that, you know, Australia is quite close to the opportunity that our Asian neighbours represent. So, for example, we've got Virgin Australia Fashion Festival going on in Melbourne at the moment. And there was a, a breakfast put on by the Victorian government the, the other day. Sorry, Victorian government the other day. Um, and they had VIP.com, which is a e-tailing platform from China. Now, given you both sort of rolling your eyes, I'm assuming you've never heard of VIP.com. No. It's 
huge. Is it? And it's booming <laughs> and it's taking over, you know, it's moved from China into the States and just expanding at this, you know, phenomenal rate. And now, you know, they've come into Australia and there's just this huge opportunity for Australian brands now to have this access point into China and vice versa. Um, and so from my perspective, it's how do we how do we capitalise on that opportunity and how do we um, de-risk and maximise return to our investors? And that's we need to have two other markets that are more progressive and, and have different opportunities to, you know, um, satisfy those two points of de-risking and, and maximising returns. Mm. Does that mean you've learnt Chinese? I have a tiny bit of Mandarin. Shishini. Mm, Shishie and <laughs> Seitian and Ni Hao, Ni Hao Ma. But um, oh, I'm... I'm we'll give you money. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I basically just said hi and how are you? That's um, all I need. <laughs> no one asked. <laughs> yeah. But I'm trying to learn as quickly as I, as I can. So I hope by the time I come back in two years I can have most of this conversation in Chinese so that wow. means you'll have to come along for the journey done I'm in <laughs> really cool that's, yeah. a, that's a good challenge mm. so that's the next chapter yeah and I mean you've taken the experience because again and I, and I keep coming back to your career it's it's so like you, you've just ridden this wave of opportunity 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 now it's it's sort of uh capitalizing i guess in capital x mm. and now you're taking that and going to to china um what 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 does success look like for you now yeah it's a really good question um i don't feel successful yet what? and success will come for me when i can sit back that blows my mind well when you're a VC, it's about how can, where are the results to prove that you've been somewhere? Where's the impact, right? Being on Necker Island. Cool experience. But cool for me, but what's that done for the wider community? Ah, oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. So it's, it's great for me. <laughs> yeah. Like, best 10 days of your life. Everyone put on your bucket list. Yeah. You know, phenomenal. But for me, really, success will be able to come when I can sit back and say, We've changed the dynamic in an ecosystem that didn't previously recognise the value of female talent, that we've invested in up to 500. So let's say that we get to 300. That's a significant difference from where we are now. Mm. If we deploy $50 million that then goes on to help build even one unicorn, $1 billion female company, and there are lots of female Unicorns, just not well known. I mean, a great um, example of that is Linda Weinberg, who founded Linda.com. Linda.com exited to LinkedIn, now Microsoft, for $1.5 billion in April of 2015. No one knows her name. That's You're the right. training thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we've got, if you look at great Australian talent that's been adopted by China, um, Jess Williams, uh, Wilson, sorry, not Williams, Jess Wilson, who's got stashed, which is like fashion for Tinder. And so the yeah. algorithm starts to learn whether you're a guy or whether you're a girl, your preference in, yeah. in clothes that you like to wear. Right. And you start to put your clothes into your online yeah. wardrobe and then you can go through and purchase. So Jess um, got to participate in a reality TV show um, called, oh, she'll she'll kill me if I get the name wrong, but I think it was The Last <laughs> Unicorn. It's something unicorn in China. And, you know, she won third place. Wow. So the only Westerner, the only female, wow. and as a result, you know, she's secured international VC dollars into the business and it's it's growing over there. Wow. So, you know, Jess is very vocal in the, the startup ecosystem and, and should be and is an amazing role model for other women and um, Canva as well, which is one of Australia's Canva, biggest success stories. Yeah, Shoes of Prey. So what we need now as an ecosystem is is exits. Yep. Because that's a real stamp of approval. Done, dusted, investors get all, you know, get their money back um, and sit and there with a glass of champagne and say, that was a great <laughs> thing, Let's let me do it again. Well, then you can be there to catch the reinvestment. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and then, you know, um, for them to act as role models to encourage more individuals, regardless of gender, but really specifically um, so that other young women coming up and, and look at them and say, 
if they can do that, I can do that. Mm. Uh, LearnVest was a big company, or still is a big company in, in the US, and it was financial education. Now, uh, the name of the founder escapes me, uh, but it was a female, and she sold, I think, for almost half a billion dollars or, or, or to that extent. And financial advice is very much in this education arena, and it took a psychologist, she was actually a psychologist, not a financial planner, and created this massive business. I think we're, we're seeing uh, financial advice go through this, and I used this word before, enlightening, which um, <laughs> probably makes it sound a bit more... Uh, you know, uh, romantic than it needs to be, but regardless, <laughs> let's just use it for the moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm I'm pretty sure we're going to start to see some big changes in financial mm-hmm. advice, especially around because it's changing so much, it's changing so rapidly. Um, let's say out there, uh, there's there's a financial advisor and they're thinking about getting into um, this startup space, right? right. Male or female. Um, what kind of advice would you give uh, to them to say, okay, they want to disrupt financial advice? How would they go about doing it? Make sure you've got a globally scalable idea, right? So try, test, fail, refine your business model before you sort of leave your day job or leave that security. Um, read Lean Startup. It's just the Bible. It'll teach you all the key things and making sure that you actually prove your business model before you go out and try and sell something that you think that everybody wants, but the market doesn't necessarily want, um, except that it's going to take you far longer than you ever thought it would. Develop relationships now um, that you'll need in the future, and that's investors, that's um, corporate partners, Get yourself visible. Um, start with a business, even today, that's just start selling stuff online, whether it's eBay or anything, just to understand the customer journey and experience and online SaaS platforms. Um, go to meetups, get educated, because I think there's, at the moment, it's this perception that being an entrepreneur and a startup founder is akin to being like a world famous rock star. Mm. It's not. It's a gladiator support. It's a gladiator, sorry, sport. It has a 90% failure rate. To go into it, you're crazy, <laughs> but good crazy. And it's the most, I think. Um, oh, Clay's good crazy. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the most um, exciting, valuable experience of your life, but it's tough. And, you know, lastly, really build out a plan for yourself. This comes back to another passion point for me, which is make sure you've got a team around you and a plan for what happens when you fail because the journey of an entrepreneur is very up and very down. And unfortunately, in the startup community, we have a very high, and this is globally, mental health problem. You know, it's really, really hard. So make sure you've got a backup plan for failing. So when you have one of those bad days, you've got someone to talk to or got the dog to go for a walk with because that just evens out the, the bumps, the troughs and the peaks. Very awesome. Very awesome. Um, uh, Patty, do you have any uh, questions pre-planned, my man? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. You can ask whatever you I reckon, want. I reckon we were talking about the concept of, I guess, um, female advisors and I guess the differences in what they're able to mm. do sometimes with clients compared to what would be traditional? Like I've seen, I've seen female and male advisors behave exactly the same way and yep. with the same sort of characteristics. But I guess you've got these natural states that sort of come out. And uh, I think we, were, I guess, well, Clay was sort of alluding to how things are evolving and the discussions in advice are evolving a bit more, mm. and it's moving away from like the tangible sort of money, like in your hand, greed sort of dynamic to mm. a space where it's like. It's a bit more transient. It's it's sort of uh, like people are people are looking at how they spend their money a bit more. They're it's look- life coaching yeah. mixed with financial planning. Hmm. And I think we're also seeing, you know, this desire for investors, regardless of gender, to say, I don't want to put my money just into something that's damaging the environment. You know, I want to do good and I want to do good business. I had a client the other day, email. I 
I I heard about these uh, these other ethical subjects. investments, ethical, yeah. ethical yeah. ECG, yep. these social impact, it's, all of that stuff. Yeah, it's doubled in the last I think a uh, couple of years. Mm. Uh, it's still it's still an uh, you would call it an in proportion to the market. Yeah, it's still, still around five yeah. percent. It's not massive, but it, it's it's a massive thing that's growing. Well, I think there's still a lot of people questioning: Can you do good and do good business? Right. Um, and I think if you look at a company like Salesforce, you know, that's a, that's a company that is singing from the rooftops. We can do both. Mm. And, again, it comes back to role modelling. I think when we see more of those businesses be successful, I think Salesforce just continues year on year to have, like, triple-digit growth. They're massive. We just went to their annual uh, conference in here Sydney, in yeah. Sydney. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, multiple, cool. multiple levels. That They make... A shit ton of money. Yeah, if yeah. they can spend on the uh, day call like that, there was a... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And good on them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know? And yeah. that, that's a business that was founded in this idea of um, uh, the family starting in Hawaii. How do we, you know, how do we look after everyone? How do we create great profit? How do we deliver a product and solution that makes everyday life easier and delivers a, a return on investment to both the company and also to those using it. So um, I think to, to, to move the dial on getting more people into this sort of space and, and, and leveraging this trend is to see that you can satisfy both of those goals. Yeah. Do you think, do you think it's giving up on, I guess, uh, more traditional held business objectives that gets you there like I'm, I've always tried to oscillate between oh do you have to sacrifice to be social and I guess like what you're saying with Salesforce it's I, don't, I don't think I think we're moving into an era where you don't have to sacrifice it comes together you actually well I, I reckon some businesses the more social they are it actually leans yeah. to a yeah. better outcome Ben and Jerry's is one of those as well for yeah. sure you know there's lots of great examples I think we're seeing whether it's the entertainment sector whether it's VC whether it's there's this recalibration and um, as long as recalibration results in um, better impact overall, um, then I think that's a, that's a great thing. I think we, can, we, sh- we should be looking to leave behind the past and how can we do things better where everybody wins. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think more and more that's just going to be something that we're going to try test fail and, and more quickly adapt because the speed of disruption is just skyrocketing. I mean, in 1955, the average lifespan of a company on the S&P 500 was over 65 years. Mm. Today it's under 15 years and in the next, you know, 10 years it'll be under, you know, um, 10 or so. So, wow. you know, I, I think sitting back and, and saying we've we've done it this way always or that's worked to deliver returns is, is just going to fail. I mean, look what happened in the GFC and we had these huge companies that just disappeared. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's an exciting time. I think it's an exciting time to be someone that's, you know, um, looking after and advising people about their money, but it's – I think the need to be really educated as to what's going on at a macro level and understanding the implications of technology and all the components of the fourth revolution, robotics, AI, automation is, I don't think you can sit there and be an advisor anymore and be blind to, to that stuff. Well, mm. to that end, um, you're talking about the, this fourth, uh, fourth revolution. Mm. Um, what percentage of a portfolio should the average person have allocated to VCs to high risk to higher. I look at it from a macro point of view. What what would you suggest? This is financial advice, by the way. Guys. <laughs> Someone please play the the, 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 the disclaimer. The disclaimer. <laughs> um, I think it, it depends on the individual's cool um, personal um, financial state. So you sure. should never be investing in a high risk um, uh, area of investment if if you can't afford to lose that money. Totally. So. And I wouldn't go out and invest all your money straight away as well, especially if you haven't had experience in this sector. Mm. Go and learn and and maybe, you know, look at the different models of, of, of VC. Um, get out there, understand the ecosystem, maybe swap a bit of time and expertise for a tiny bit of equity or, you know, a, a return or a commission on helping a startup bring in new clients. Yep. 
but don't just jump into throwing money into something because it's cool and you want to be part of the gang if you can't afford to lose that money. Mm. So it's it's very much on an independent basis. Very good point. Um, and 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 just to wrap us up, uh, one of the coolest things was that you just spoke at Harvard. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did. So yes. tell it quickly. Quickly tell us about that. Um, it was a full circle moment for me. Um, clearly that night that I told my dad I was dyslexic was like what set my life up for, for the next, you know, 25 years. A- at the time that I told him, um, we had a, a family member that was at Harvard. Mm. And I remember thinking, that is so cool. Like, <laughs> of course. like that's the pinnacle of education, right? But that's not going to be for me. That's, that's just not something I'm ever going to get to do. And... You know, I remember that feeling of exclusion and sadness and stupidity and, you know, all that self-doubt and self-loathing. So to be invited um, to even be there was just like the greatest honour and, and it came on the morning that my um, dad died last year of Alzheimer's. So I'm not a believer in all that sort of, you know, serendipity sort of stuff, but mm. it was very significant to that's, me. Yeah, that's amazing. So to go over and to, to speak and, and get access to these amazing young minds that are just working on huge, big problems and creating these amazing solutions really gave me a whole lot of confidence that our future is in really, really good hands. But I think it's it's so important to sit with yourself, and I try and do this every year, and, you know, ask myself, what would I really like to do with my life? And not get into, I can't, it's not possible, that's not for me, and put it on the list. And once it's on the list, your brain starts to figure out, how do I do that? Um so I, I hope in sharing that thank you. No, that's so uh, – oh, 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 out of everything, you know, I, I definitely wanted to, to wrap up on that because uh, you, you tw- I think uh, I was reading in an article about you that it was, you know, 20 years after yeah. you'd spoken to your dad about your yeah. dyslexia that you, there you are yeah. presenting at Harvard at a, at a time where you thought you would, you'd never be a part of it. Never. Super cool. All right, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming in thank and sharing with Thank you for having me, us. guys. Yeah, um, cool. you, you're, you're uh, like a leader in not just, you know, um, the startup world, but also it, with females in business. And, and, and so it's just been a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. See ya.